Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It gives you the tools and inspiration to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. This is where we explore how to cultivate remarkable cultures, cultures that scale and evolve as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. There are ways to integrate playfulness in the workplace on a regular basis and at a regular cadence with intention. And it all comes from the leader. It comes from top down, having leaders that are prepared to laugh themselves and have some laughs and make work feel like it's a fun place to be. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a one of a kind accelerate a program where culture leaders get hands-on support and guidance on how to reach their goals faster, especially now in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. Culture Brain connects you with outstanding peers on the same journey, but also with world-class experts, including people you know from the show. And they all help you identify and implement new, better ways of creating a culture where people do their best work. Check it out at tinyurl.com forward slash culturebrained. And no need to write it down. There's a link in the show notes. Hey gang, welcome to episode 106 of the Culture Lab podcast. In times like these, when the world is experiencing so much devastation and so much chaos, speaking about play can seem trivial and unimportant. But as it turns out, play is seriously important for our well-being. It's also incredibly important for cultivating healthy company cultures. In fact, there are multiple studies that show that play is one of the key factors that separates successful teams from less successful ones. It also helps us reduce stress and and anxiety. It promotes creativity and innovation, and it has a profound impact on our mental, emotional, and physical well-being. And this is exactly why I am so excited to bring you this interview with my guest, Christy Harold. We talk about the many benefits of play at work, but also about how to incorporate play in how we run our businesses. Christy is the founder and CEO of Jam, a multi-million dollar global business that has connected millions of people through play. It's actually one of the largest adult recreational sports leagues in the world. Christy is also the author of It Pays to Play, How Play Improves Business Culture. In 2022, she was included on Canada's Top 100 Most Powerful Women Ranking, and she was a top three finalist in the Canadian Women Entrepreneur Awards. Her company, Jam, was awarded Canada's Most Admired Culture Award in 2022, and it has been certified as a great place to work. Also, it was named the best remote startup to work for. So as you can see, we've got a lot to learn from her. So with no further ado, here is Christy Harold. My name is Christy Harold. I am the founder and CEO of JAM, and we connect people through play and help companies profit through play. And I'm the author of a book called It Pays to Play, How Play Improves Business Culture. Christy, thank you for coming onto the show. And I think I found you thanks to this book. It was being promoted somewhere on one of the platforms that I was on. And I was like, oh, I really have to speak to Christy because it's such an interesting topic for me. So can't wait to dive into it. But before we go there, I have a question that I ask all of our guests at the beginning of every interview. And the question is, what were the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person? Oh, it's great to be here. First of all, thank you for inviting me on. And what a great question. I think the earliest cultural influences for me would have been 
sitting at a family dinner table growing up, an entrepreneurial family dinner table, and hearing my dad talk about how important people are in the organization. And in university, I ran a student painting franchise. It was called College Pro Painters, which provided incredible training on how to run a business. And my very first summer, halfway through the summer, at the end of June, half of my painters quit painting. And I realized the reason they quit was because I was acting like a dictator. I had not shared my vision with them. I hadn't shared the purpose of what we were doing. I I hadn't shared my values with them. I didn't have any fun incentives. And I remember talking to my dad and I was struggling because I had to stop everything. I had to stop production. I had to stop marketing and selling so that I could go back to recruiting, trying to find new painters, interviewing, hiring, training. And it really set me back. And after that point, I, I really changed my ways as a leader. And I remember my dad saying, if you don't have people, you have nothing. If you don't have good people, you've got nothing. And after that, those same painters in the second half of that summer stayed with me for two and a half years as painters. So I really learned my lesson early. And it was, I think, thanks to my dad is probably the biggest influence for sure. It's such an important thing if you can have someone in your family to help you realize that early on, because I had a similar experience when I was young. One of my first jobs, well, maybe second, was we set up a startup with a friend of mine. It was an ice cream manufacturing factory. My dream job, I love ice cream to this day. And we obviously knew nothing, zero knowledge on how to create a healthy environment for these people. So we learned our lessons the hard way. So you were lucky to have your dad, I think. Mm Yeah. Yeah. So before we unpack the topic of play, I want to share something with you, Christy. In my research, and after analyzing thousands of data points from dozens of organizations around the world, I discovered that thriving company cultures are built on three pillars. And one of them is what I call deep fun. And it's basically the joy of work itself. And playfulness plays a huge part in it. So I want us to zoom in on play today. And I guess the first question probably to ask is, could you give us a thumbnail of what play is? How do you define it? Yeah, a great question again. I think a lot of people get confused by or maybe roll their eyes a little bit at my book topic idea before they really understand. And they think, well, we're not going to play at work. We've got work to do. And this is where I'm excited by the book and the message, because the whole point, it's, it's not about going to work and playing volleyball in the office all day. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is exactly what you just said, is, is the idea of incorporating some playfulness and fun into the workplace. And that can be done through fun work and th- through making work just more joyful. And, and there are so many ways to do that. The companies that feel that having a once a year company picnic makes for a great culture, I would say, no, I think that's really important. You should do that for sure. Having that once a year is not what makes for a fun culture. There are ways to integrate playfulness in the workplace on a regular basis and at a regular cadence with intention. And it all comes from the leader. It comes from top down, having leaders that are prepared to laugh themselves and have some laughs and make work feel like it's a fun place to be. There's just so many ways to do that. The definition of play is doing something for a recreational purpose, just for the joy of it. So, you, you know, getting into a flow state. And there are ways to make that happen at work. And we still have to have the board meetings. We still have to have spreadsheets. The work has to get done. But you can have some laughs while you're doing that. Given that definition, that is doing something for recreational purposes, not necessarily to get specific outcomes, I do understand that pushback that we get from people because I get exactly the same reaction from people that I talk to about fun at work, especially at the beginning when they don't yet understand what exactly we mean by that. And I think there is this assumption that We have a limited time. And if we spend some of that limited time on activities that have a recreational purpose, 
they don't really contribute to us being productive. And we try to squeeze as much work into our work days as possible. So what do you have to say to people who push back on that and say, we simply don't have the luxury of spending time on recreational activities during our work days? I actually believe, and science has proven, when you take small breaks during your day to have some fun and just to get up from your desk and move around a little bit, it's like taking a little mini vacation. It re-energizes and it refocuses us. But further, you know, think about our childhoods. When we went to school as children, we took recess breaks and we went outside and played for a few minutes. And then we went back inside and we focused on our work. And then we went back outside at lunch and we played with our friends and went back inside. That happened in the afternoon. And then we would have longer breaks for holiday vacations and such. And that's important at work as well. And there are also ways to have fun with the work we're doing. It's just a matter of communication styles. And again, as I said earlier, the idea of having leaders that are able to have some laughs with their team while the work is getting done. It's both. It's a sentiment of of making sure you do take little breaks so that you can refocus and re-energize yourself. But also while you're actually doing the work, you could be having a little bit of fun as well. Yeah. There are a few threads that I want to pull out here. The first one is making these pauses. I learned the importance of that from a friend of mine, Jeanette Brunet, who has recently had a new book coming out. And she was also a guest on the show twice already. So for our listeners, you can go back and and listen to her. And she talks about power pausing, not posing, but pausing. And absolutely, there's so much strong research that shows how beneficial it can be to our productivity, actually. But I also want to ask you, Christy, have you heard of the work of George Land? I don't think I have, no. George Land was this guy who basically supported NASA in 1960s to recruit the team that would put the man on the moon. And he devised a creativity test so that they can find the most brilliant and the most creative individuals who could pull off the biggest, most challenging mission. And as we know, the test uh, really worked because the mission was accomplished. And what he discovered after he finished his work with NASA, he started testing it with children. And so the first time he used it on children, I think it was 1,600 children in, in the sample group. Uh, what he discovered was that 98% of children could be qualified as creative geniuses. And so he was intrigued and he tested them again five years later. And five years later, the same group, the same conditions, the same tests. It was only 30% of children. Wow. And then five years later, so now they are 15 years old, it was just 12%. And the final test that he ran with this group was when these children were grown-ups and they were already, I think, 30 years old. It was only 2%. So basically he said, you know, it's clear to me, my research is conclusive, non-creative behaviors are acquired, they are learned. And it seems like when we are children, and it's all about play, right? All about play, all about creativity. We are at our most creative and it's funny and ironic because so many organizations that we work with complain that their employees are not innovative enough. I wonder why. <laughs> so that's a really, really interesting research. One of the core values of my organization at JAM is find a better way, because we believe that change while challenging is actually really beneficial, right? We can always be looking for, for better ways to do things, to innovate and to create. I'd like to share this as an example because it might plant the seed for some, some of your listeners around how you can still get work done, but be innovative. We recently had our annual retreat. All of our employees came in globally and, and connected for a few days, and we called it our Jamboree. And at Jamboree, we had one of our brainstorming sessions. It was a work session, but we were trying to come up with new ideas. And so we called our work session, it was the Shark Tank session. We were broken into teams, and everyone was given a mission, and they had to try and come up with different ideas around a topic. But we did it as a Shark Tank style. I love Shark Tank, by the way. Yeah, it was work, and it was productive, but it was done in a fun way by putting the Shark Tank spin on it. That's how you can integrate playfulness. 
And it brought out incredibly creative and innovative ideas. Because we had the element of playfulness, there was no right or wrong answers expected. It opened the doors for people to to really have big blue sky ideas that they weren't going to be scoffed at. It was highly encouraged to just think big and go for the moon. Yeah, totally. There are a lot of benefits and I want us to talk a little bit more about what are the benefits of including play and playfulness at work. Obviously, innovation is a clear one. But before we talk about benefits, I also want to talk about what can happen when there is not enough play in the workplace. I have to say, I love the way you start your book, It Pays to Play, uh, with a quote from Margaret Mead, where she says, it is utterly wrong and cruelly arbitrary to put all the play and learning into childhood, all the work into middle age, and all the regrets into old age. It's such a beautiful quote. And I've never come across it. So thank you for including it. Oh, I'm glad you saw it. Yeah, I really, I love that quote. I have that in my speaking talk as well. I love that Margaret Mead quote. She was quite a um, interesting woman. She wasn't afraid to push the, the boundaries and question status quo. So I love using her as an example. 100 years ago, she was pushing on environmental issues and women's rights. And so the fact that she was questioning play and why we stop back then is is fantastic. Yeah. And so I know that you've done a lot of work in the space and a lot of research. So what are the implications of almost completely eliminating play uh, from our adult lives? And I'm not even just talking about work only, but generally eliminating play from our lives. Well, it's a big question. I mean, there are so many benefits to play that when it's eliminated, we're losing all these amazing opportunities. So In general, in in our personal lives, the creative, innovative side of us gets squashed when we're not open to to playfulness. But further, studies have proven, as an example, with physical activity, we all know it's really good for us to exercise. That's just a given. We're all aware of that, and the science backs that up. The Mayo Clinic has done studies that have proven when we combine our physical exercise with play, so you know, if all you can do is go to the gym and work out on a treadmill and lift weights, you should totally do that. It's, it's going to benefit you. However, if a few days a week you can combine your physical exercise with play by perhaps playing some tennis or a game of basketball or soccer, football, the benefits of that, it will add years to your life. They have done studies that have proven it can add up to 20% longevity to our lives. And that's incredibly powerful when it's just it's just about We're physically connecting. And the reason for that is the mental health benefit, the socialization that happens when we play with others is incredibly powerful. Studies have shown recently that loneliness is a serious issue. It's been compared, uh, Juliet Hold Lundstedt, I believe is her name. uh, She's done a study that has shown that loneliness is the equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's how bad it is for our health. So if we can play and get a little bit of that social connection, it will help with loneliness, it helps with depression, and thus our overall physical health benefits as well. That's just one example on a personal note. But then in the workplace, because when we play, again, whether it's having a Shark Tank playful work session, or it's taking a little mini break during the work afternoon to go actually use the ping pong table that's sitting in your office versus having it sit there because you want it to look like a cool office and it just collects dust. If you get up and actually play a game of five minute game of ping pong with everyone who's in the office, we play around the world all the time. It's a little mini recess break. It's a little mini vacation and it energizes everyone. And the benefit of that is when you play, you are strengthening bonds and friendships with your colleagues. And when you have a stronger friendship connection with those people, you're more willing to be vulnerable. You trust them more. When you're friends with someone, you're more willing to want to help them with things, and you're also more willing to ask for help, which all of that benefits the workplace culture. It will all benefit the overall productivity of an organization. So the power of play, it's just massive, and it's, it runs deep. It's really not that complicated, and it doesn't need to be overly expensive or time-consuming. It's a mindset. It is a mindset. And I think because it was absent from our workplaces for such a long time, 
whilst intellectually maybe people can say, yeah, sure, it makes sense, but they lack the experience of what play can do actually for a team or for you even at a personal level. I had a personal experience with my last employer before I strike out on my own and create my own company where I joined a large consultancy with a plan to stay there maybe for two years max. I'm an introvert, by the way, so I'm not a huge fan of team activities and stuff like that. It always feels a little bit uncomfortable. And so I joined that team and worked with a leader who I think intuitively knew about the value of play to create meaningful connections and create really strong teams. So as a team, we did so many things together, including traveling, but also just smaller activities during the workday. And having that experience, it really helped me understand how important play is in creating that team spirit, because I honestly had no idea about exactly the, you know, the power you have to experience it, I think, to really understand. And so my question to you is, if someone is listening to that and wants to offer this transformational experience to people, even to the leaders in the organization, so that they can understand the value of play and the impact that it can have on teams' productivity, creativity, people's engagement, and so on. What is a good gateway drug, let's say? <laughs> what is a good way to introduce them to the power of fun? I'd say there are a couple different things that I would encourage people to consider. One that is really easy to implement right away. I believe that the pillars of a strong work culture, we all think of mission, vision, values. And, and I really believe those are critically important. However, those in and of themselves, having your values written on the wall does nothing if your team isn't engaged and connected and, and excited to make that happen, right? We need a connected, cohesive team to bring all that to life. So in order to get your team feeling connected with each other and engaged with each other and having fun with each other to help get behind all that, those pillars, there are a few really easy things you can start with. One would be Set up a, a shout out channel on your team's chat or your, your Slack. Have a channel. We call it our shout out channel. And every day, anyone can throw shout outs to their team. It's a celebration. You're sharing gratitude and sharing gratitude is incredibly powerful for both the person receiving the gratitude and the person giving the gratitude. There's a benefit to both sides of there. And so you're basically publicly shouting people out for great work being done we tend to try and focus it around our, our core values. We'll acknowledge, hey, just wanted to shout out Andrew for treating everyone like his best friend because he did this, blah, blah, blah. And you share an example in a quick message. We have shout outs happening three, four, five times a day. You'll see shout outs. Sometimes you'll, you'll see 10 in a day and then there might be a day where there's just one or two. But when there's great work being done, it's being celebrated regularly. There's no rules around it. It's just shout people out when you see good things happening. That's really an easy thing. It's playful, it's celebratory, and it can actually focus, you can focus it back right on your core values or your, your vision or your mission purpose. You can spin it all back to that. Another thing I would encourage that's perhaps more what people might think of as when they think of getting play happening in the workplace would be have a virtual, either a virtual or in-person, depends, there's so many hybrid workplaces now, right? Where teams are either working fully remotely or there's a combination of some people are going into the office and others are, are working from home or everyone's fully in the office. Whatever it is, find a pulse of a monthly social and that can be a virtual social. So we, you know, have a lunch and laugh. We call them lunch and laughs where you can either do it on your own, everyone jump on a Zoom call or, or hire an organization to run a, a game show for you or a scavenger hunt or a trivia event. Or there's so many ways. And I know sometimes people will roll their eyes on that and be like, I'm so over that. And the truth is taking that 45 minute break to have some laughs with your colleagues is incredibly powerful. It re-energizes, it reconnects us. And it actually also what it does is there's a power in putting C-suite with an intern, you know, you get broken into teams, you're in a breakout room, you get to know people that you know, you wouldn't necessarily work with day to day in meetings, and you're having some laughs with them. And so it opens up these boundaries, it, it lifts barriers that may otherwise be there that people don't even realize 
these unseen barriers that can kind of squash a culture or create some toxicity, it really helps to relieve that. And I would always encourage that when you're doing events like that, that you make them optional because some people that are introverted may not want to be part of that. And that's fine. However, often what will happen is they'll hear people laughing about it the next day in a, in a meeting about that funny thing that happened. Remember when the, you know, the CFO was talking to the intern in the middle of that escape room and the, you know, ha ha ha. And they kind of go, oh, I missed that. I should maybe join the next time. And so have a regular cadence, have a monthly lunch and laugh where it's just the third Wednesday of every month, we're going to have a fun event and it doesn't need to be overly costly or time consuming. And uh, it can really hold a lot of power. I would suggest there are easy ways to integrate playfulness right within the work itself with shout out channels, but then also actually have some just planned social breaks. Yeah, totally. And as a self-proclaimed introvert, and I've mentioned the story with my last employer where I planned to join for just two years, but the fact that the environment in that team was playful and there was a very healthy cadence of these recreational activities and fun activities that we had, I actually stayed for much longer. I think it was six and a half years. That's amazing. Yes. And really, honestly, the only reason was that I felt so close to the people that I was working with and had so much fun working with them that it was just almost impossible to leave. So I think it's a testament to what it can do for your retention as well. And I want to pull on this thread of cadence as well, because you've mentioned this word a few times already today. What would be the right cadence? Like how often do you need to have these activities to keep the spirit? Because I guess before it becomes second nature, I think sometimes people need a little bit of structure, a little bit of maybe some nudges to engage in these activities. So similar to the grade school idea where there's recess breaks, there's a lunch break, you play after school, you have weekends every week, uh, you have holiday longer breaks, and then you have a full summer vacation that's two months long. So I sort of compare the what I believe there, there are different levels of playfulness that should be happening daily. That's having a shout out channel. We have a daily huddle. It's a seven minute meeting that everyone on the team joins. It's a mandatory meeting if you're available. If you have a more important meeting, obviously you should go to your more important meeting, something comes up. But we have this daily huddle that everyone jumps on and huddle is led by a different person every single day. And at the end of huddle, there's always leader's choice and leader's choice is typically, it's typically something funny and it brings out some laughs and it doesn't have to be funny. Sometimes it might be someone encouraging you to reach out and call a friend you haven't talked to in a year. Or it might be the leader might say, we're all going to do 20 push-ups or 30 sit-ups or something. <laughs> or it might be, Leader's Choice might be, post a picture of yourself uh, from your favorite Halloween costume. It's, it's different every single day because it's a different leader. So that's a daily pulse of something playful happening. Same with the shout-out channels. On a weekly basis, we have other ways that we celebrate great work being done with our Top Shelf Teammate Award once a week. This And this is all in my book. It, it spells it out, but we have core value awards once a month. And it's a fun way to celebrate somebody who's really living and breathing the core value. We have a monthly jam session, which jam is the company I run. And, and we do we do run virtual events for other organizations all around the world, as well as in person and hybrid events. But we do our own jam sessions with our own team, because we really we walk the walk, we don't just talk the talk. And I'll tell you, Aga, you talked about a retention. I had two employees leave during the pandemic because they had opportunities to earn more money and have different experiences. And they both, within four to six months, left their jobs and came back to jam. Luckily, we had room to, to get them back. They're both amazing. I talk about both Sandeep and Taylor in my book as well. They came back for culture. We couldn't pay them as much as they were earning. But they both talked about how their mental health, the fact that they were working in these organizations where people didn't care about them as friends, it was impacting them. They weren't excited to be working there and they wanted to work in a place where they felt cared about and where they had friends and where they could have some fun. The pulse of playfulness at work, you should have little pulses of playfulness every day, but then have a social event every month that's a little more intentional, a little more planned. And then have your big 
annual, you know, a big hurrah, that summer break, right? Like it's, I think you need to, we need to mix different levels of playfulness throughout every day, every week, every month and annually. Yeah. I think it's so incredibly important and it might sound frivolous, but actually when you start seeing the impact that it has on your team and all the important indicators that we tend to follow as entrepreneurs or as uh, team leaders, like engagement, like retention, like productivity, once you see what impact it has, there's no going back. Definitely the business cases is huge for this. I've personally experienced it many times. So I'm mindful of time. I know that uh, we are drawing to a close. Christy, I want to give you an opportunity. You are speaking to an audience of people who are responsible for driving some sort of a culture shaping initiative in their organization. What is your message to them? How would you guide them or encourage them to create workplaces that, yes, are productive and yes, are successful and profitable, but also are places where people wake up in the morning on Mondays and instead of going, ugh, it's Monday again, oh my God, I, I can't, I don't want to, they go, hmm, okay, it's another fun day at work. What are your words of wisdom to close our conversation with? Remember, like Margaret Mead said, you know, we're never too old to play, that play shouldn't just be kept to childhood. And remember that the power of play is that when we play, we strengthen connections and friendships. And when we have friendships at work, we're much more excited to go to work and the powerful benefits will filter throughout the overall organization, including, you know, happier employees make for happier customers. So it really will help your bottom line. And one of my other favorite quotes to remind ourselves about the importance of continuing to play is George Bernard Shaw said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. So my final words, I think, would have to be, keep playing. Yeah, I love that. So let's shift gears. We have this section in the show that is called Rapid Fire Questions. And the idea is that I'm going to ask you five questions in rapid succession, and you'll try to answer all of them in under two minutes. Sounds good. All right, let's go. I don't know if I've mentioned, but at Culture Brained at my company, we are on a mission to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. And so I want to ask you, what would be your number one tip to bring more meaning to the workplace? We've talked about fun quite a bit, so I'm changing it up a little bit. And let's talk about meaning. What can we do to give people more meaning? That's a tricky one I, because it's so vastly different for every organization. Finding ways for people to connect and create friendships will give them a sense because whatever the purpose or the meaning of the, the business you're running, put that aside. If they know they can go help someone in the workplace, that will give them a sense of, of meaning and belonging and, and helpfulness and purpose. Just by knowing they're going to be able to help a friend in the workplace, they'll feel good about that. You know, it's so fascinating because this is one of the findings from my research around meaning. So one of the things, one of the predictors of a strong sense of meaning is when people can experience the impact of the work on a colleague within the organization. Yeah. It's interesting because usually we think, oh, people want to know what the impact of the work is going to be on the customer or a patient or whatever, depending on the industry. But actually, it can be equally powerful, if not more sometimes, when we can have an experience of how our work or our existence in, in an organization is having an impact on our colleagues. Absolutely. Yeah. So what are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? What do you notice? I would say if, if you look around, if nobody in your office has a friend in the office, that's a pretty good sign that your culture is uh, needs some work. If you've got high turnover, and also if you have a low NPS score, if you're measuring the satisfaction of your customers, and that's low, good possibility it's because your employees aren't happy and they're not engaged and feeling a sense of, of belonging or community at the organization. So your culture probably could use some work. Mm -hmm. Are there any companies that you admire for the culture? And if yes, why? Oh, yes. I've always looked up to 1-800-GOT-JUNK and O2E Brands, Brian Scudamore. They dream big. They have a lot of fun uh, while still working hard, delivering a great service. Another organization is Savannah Bananas, uh, my friend Jesse Cole. 
is the leader of Savannah Bananas. And they are a baseball team out of Savannah, and they just have a very playful, fun mindset. They're always trying new things. They're always willing to find a better way and innovate with a mindset around fans first. They just are super creative and fun with how they come up with new ways of running their business. Oh, and what are the books that you would recommend? And they can be books on culture, on leadership, on philosophy, anything really that you feel might be useful for our listeners. Well, I would love to recommend It Pays to Play, How Play Improves Business Culture. That's a, It's a fun, easy read and will give some really uh, fun tactical ideas I hope that people will enjoy to be able to try implementing in their own workplace. Another book, which I have read, and I, this might sound biased, it's my brother's book. My brother Cameron Harold wrote the book Vivid Vision, and it's all about setting uh, goals and intentions for your company. I found it to be an incredibly powerful book. My mind is blown now. This is crazy. I had no idea that he's your brother. Yes. Yeah, he's not <laughs> and- my husband. It drives me crazy when people think he's my husband. Ew, no, he's not my husband. <laughs> I didn't I didn't make the connection at all. And I was interviewing someone else actually on the show yesterday and they've mentioned your brother for the upteenth time. I don't oh, remember great. how many times. Yeah, I've heard about him and his book. And I was like, mental note, I need to invite him <laughs> to be a guest. <laughs> so I, I guess that it would be probably one of your recommendations for an amazing guest on the show as well. Okay, that's he awesome. He would be great. We, we really did grow up at an entrepreneurial dinner table. We learned a lot at the dinner. And so he and I um, you know, have similar, similar values around uh, business. But he is, he's brilliant. And his book, Vivid Vision, is a really powerful book. Another book I, I think is fantastic is Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's a really powerful read. And we've worked through that with our leadership team. And I've encouraged my leaders on our team to work through it with their departmental teams as well, to break the chapters down. And it's a really powerful book to to sort of help. It's all about trust and vulnerability and being okay with with rumbling. And I don't I don't call it conflict, we call it rumbling at, at jam. But anyway, yeah, yeah, thank you. We will put uh, links in the show notes for our listeners to all these books. So final question, what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow, something actionable and practical, to build their own culture lab and to start cultivating a culture that will help them and their teams to bring their vision to life? Super easy, as I mentioned earlier. Start playfully celebrating great things. Have a shout out channel. If you do not already have a shout out channel on your Teams or Slack, start one today. As soon as you finish this podcast, go create a shout out channel for your organization. As the leaders yourselves, start by throwing a few shout outs, make a point of every couple of days putting a shout out for great work you're seeing being done. When we celebrate others, it feels good for ourselves and it feels good for them. And it starts to create a very powerful, cohesive, connected, fun culture that, you know, gets everyone excited about the work that they're doing. So true. So finally, this is the plug section. So you can basically plug anything that you'd like, obviously, and clearly I highly and wholeheartedly recommend your book. But I know that you also have other resources that you want to share with our listeners. So what is it? Where can they find it? Great. Uh, Your listeners can go to, I actually have a uh, link I created for you, Aga, for your listeners. It's at my website, Christy Harold, K-R-I-S-T-I. Harold, H E R O L D dot com slash culture lab 25. And if they go to that link, they can download my 20 page playbook PDF. And it's a whole document filled with tactical ideas that they can try and implement very quickly in the workplace or take a little more time intentionally to integrate. But lots and lots of ideas on how to make work a little more fun, as well as a 25% off. If they would like to try a lunch and laugh with our jam team, have a virtual event, a scavenger hunt or an escape room or, you know, one of our game shows, we would love to host your listeners for a fun jam event and provide them a 25% off promo code to do so. Amazing. Thank you so much, Christy. And thank you for being my guest. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's an incredibly important topic and I think undervalued and misunderstood. So I feel like we need to do a lot of work and spread the word so that people start taking fun and play more seriously. Agree. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Thank I you. It's a pleasure. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis and Labarawi 
Production Manager. Sound Producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for joining Christy and me for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share this episode with someone who might appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. If you want to dive deeper into the topics that we discuss on the Culture Lab podcast, and if you want to participate in one-of-a-kind culture accelerator program and a global community of peers, you might want to check out Culture Brain. Culture Brain is a place for people who look for new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. If you are in charge of a culture shaping initiative, and if you believe that work should be synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, I think you will feel at home in the Culture Brain community. You can learn more about it at tinyurl.com forward slash culture brained. And there's a link in the show notes. And now a quick preview of the upcoming episode. This time, my guest is Kieran Snyder. She's a highly accomplished business leader in technology field. And she's also a world renowned expert on language and bias at work. Her writing has appeared in Fortune, the New York Times, Slate and the Washington Post. And she published the initial Fortune data studies, which basically put the topic of language bias in performance feedback on the map. As the CEO and founder of Textio, Kieran led her team in the invention of augmented writing, which uses machine learning algorithms to help writers communicate more effectively. Textio's augmented writing software is used by hundreds of Fortune 1000 companies globally to recruit more inclusively and to communicate more equitably at work. Here is a short snippet from our conversation. The thing I often tell people leaders is that if you really care about making sure that people in the organization are receiving effective feedback equitably, you can't promote any manager who's not providing it. You can't give a people manager a good review if they're not engaged in systematic, high quality feedback conversations with all of their employees. Do you care enough to put compensation on the line? Right? Do you care enough to make it a real, you know, day job level accountability so that when people have to make choices about what they're spending their time on, they're choosing to spend time on that. And if it's not that important to you, no software in the world is really going to help you change your system. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do.